Hello and welcome to another episode of the 91 Podcast, the show where we dig deep into people's passions with the hope to educate, inspire and encourage you. On today's episode, we've got Dr. Trevor Adams. He's a learning coach. He's a pastoral mentor. He's a man who's deeply passionate about the youth. And also he's a founder of theblackhero.com. Welcome, Dr. Trevor. It's lovely to have you in our studio today. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me into the studio. Oh, Dr. Trevor, I heard through the grapevine that you're a great grandfather. Is this true? Yes, I am. I'm proud to be a great grandfather. Because funny enough, you don't look like one. Because <laughs> in my mind, I normally see a great grandparent as someone who's really, really old, using a walking stick. Mm -hmm. um, you don't fit any of that. Well, it's because I started very, very young, but I also make sure that I keep myself well. And nowadays, mm. uh, people living longer, mm. and um, and therefore, in fact, I I met a lady who, who was 102. 102. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, 102. Oh wow! And um, her, she was there with with her daughters. Mm. Um, I can't remember. I think she has about a hundred um, family wow. uh, members. Wow. Yes. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. So obviously you have a lot of experience with young people, yeah. being a great-grandfather, mm -hmm. and also working with the youth. Um, can you tell me a bit more about the work you do with young people? Yeah, I think when you get to a certain age, mm. you um, it should be an age of wisdom, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, there's this theorist called Eric Erickson who mm. spoke about the lifespan. We're going through different stages of our lives. And he says, when you get around my age, it should be the age of wisdom and generativity. He used the term mm -hmm. generativity. And what exactly is your age, by the uh, way? My <laughs> age is 62. Oh, 62? 62. Oh, wow. Yeah, 62. Yeah. So at this particular age, we should be concerned about the next generation, the flourishing and the well-being of the next generation. Mm. I should be running around playing with toys, mm. but I should be have that maturity, that wisdom to be able to guide the next generation. Okay. And is that what you do with the blackhero.com? Yes, it is. It's about guiding the next generation. It's about ensuring that they have the uh, insights, the understanding to help them on their life journey. So part of that is recognizing that there is a role to play, that it takes a village to raise a child. Mm. And I'm part of that village. I'm part of the elder, if you like, within that village. Mm. And um, therefore, there's a role that I have to play to guide our young people mm. along their life journey. Mistakes that I've made, successes, mm. rather than you know, young people having to make the same mistakes, mm. then I'm in a position to, to guide them. And that's not unusual. That is should have been part of our culture, and it was mm. part of our culture. But somewhere along the line, we have gone astray from that. Mm. When you talk about guiding young people, mm -hmm. um, like, let's talk about raising children. Yes. Um, do you believe in spanking children? Because many people from our, you know, ethnic background believe yes. in spanking children. Yes. Um, is this something you also believe in? I don't believe in spanking children. I think it's understanding why. You know, what is the purpose of spanking? Mm -hmm. And people would say, well, the purpose of spanking a child is to discipline a child. Okay. So I then break it down and I ask the question, what do you mean by disciplining? Yes, because if, if spanking is a purpose of discipline, mm -hmm. what do we mean by discipline? And for me, discipline means teaching a child to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. Taking a child, teaching a child to take responsibility for themselves, their lives, and the community. And you can do that without having to strike a child. Mm. Because if you start from very, very young and you start to guide the child and you show them the consequences of their action, you talk with them, you reason with them, you help them to understand. But you also teach them responsibility. So it's not just simply about mm. um, chastising a child. It's about training up a child. Mm. The Bible says, train up a child. That's mm. the key thing, train up the child. But well, even the Bible says, um, spare the rod and spoil the child. So how do you um, balance that then? Yeah, um, I knew you'd, you'd have said that <laughs> because that is it. The Bible says, you know, don't spare the rod and spoil, spoil the child. Mm. But it's a rod of correction. Mm. Not necessarily a, word of, a rod of punishment. It's a word of 
correction. How do we correct somebody who who they've done something wrong? Mm. If we uh, use in the rod, then all of us should have the rod ap- applied to us. Mm. But the rod is 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 symbolic of correction. Mm. When the Bible says about thy rod and thy staff, they mm. comfort me. That's right. Right, and um, the rod a shepherd would have a rod. And the rod which would be just simply to guide the sheep, not to strike the sheep, but to guide the sheep, mm. to set the boundaries so that the sheep know where they should walk and where they should, should, should journey. Mm. If you're a shepherd with a lot of heart and love, love and compassion, you won't strike the child. Mm. But culturally, we have been taught this is the way to discipline a child mm-hmm. by striking them which I don't think is, is the correct thing. Um, so can you tell me a bit about the blackhero.com? Why is it called the black hero? Don't you think by you know using the word black, mm-hmm. you might be separating yourself from you know other people or people who might want to go to the website might think, oh, why is it saying black? I'm not black, so I, I don't belong here. Mm-hmm. I can't go to this website. Well, the website is more, more describing me okay. as opposed to anyone who comes to, to me for, for help. Mm. but it's about my own experience and my own journey. The name comes out of my own experiences and my own, my own journey. Mm. Um, there was a anthropologist, his name is Joseph Campbell, and Joseph Campbell wrote a book called The Hero's Hero with Many Faces. Mm. Um, and in the book, there's very little attention to black heroes, heroes from black culture, mm. um, and hence the reason why um, as part of my doctoral research, I, I actually look at the concept of hero and found that when it came to black people, not a lot was said about black heroes. Mm. We were seen as the villains. We all seen it in a very, very negative way. Mm. So I've just simply flipped the coin to say that we are all heroes. But um, my identity is black and therefore a black hero. And a hero is a person who goes on a journey Mm. Uh, as a result of their journey, they transform and they come back and they contribute to their society, they contribute to their community, they contribute to the world to make the world a better place. Mm. Yeah. So if that's what you do then, you're contributing to your community, the black community? I'm com- com- um, contributing to all communities. Okay. Okay. I contribute to the black community in particular because of the issues that have been there for a long, long time that haven't been addressed. Mm. And um, what issues would, the, would those be? I think because you get very successful um, black people mm. who are possibly in, within the minority, so mm. black people do succeed despite the odds, despite the challenges, they do succeed. There's no yes, doubt about mm. it. Despite all that black people have been through, there are people who do succeed. Mm -hmm. Because we see black people who succeed, the assumption is, well, there can't be any barriers. There can't be any equalities. There there cannot be anything that stops a black person from achieving. Mm. Um, Therefore, the problem must be everyone else who's black. Mm. Because if one person can do it, then everyone everyone else can do it. it. And that is is the argument. Mm. Um, But when you look within all sectors of society, whether it's the palace, whether it's education, whether it's the police, uh, you name it, Mm -hmm. whether it's in the top boardroom, you will have one or two black people in those particular positions, Mm. but they are the minority. Mm. Um, But they are the exception to the rules rather than being the rule. So why isn't there more black people in those particular positions? The system would allow one or two people to get through, but Mm. not en masse. But also those who get through oftentimes do not go back and work with and help other people to rise up the ladder. Mm. In fact, sometimes they they can become very, very defensive, protecting their position. Mm. So they're there by themselves. But the system does that. Mm. The system does that. Now, we know through different research that there are, there are inequalities, whether it's health, and of course, COVID has um, mm. highlighted that situation. Black Lives Matters has highlighted that situation. 
And those situations aren't new. I think lots of people are responding to those situations as if, wow, this is, this, this, this is, this is a big thing, it's a new thing. Mm. But historically, they've always, it's, it's always mm. been there. It's just the fact that um, the media uh, mm. has picked up on it, the fact that social media, mm. et cetera, et cetera, becomes a way, a vehicle of uh, highlighting those things. Can you give me an example, maybe like in education? Mm -hmm. Because um, when I look around the UK, I don't really see racism as you know blatantly as you might see it in America yes. or somewhere yes. else. Yeah. So could you give us some you know examples of these inequalities, whether in education or like health that you mentioned? Right, that's a very good example. In America, in America, um, you know, you said it's blatant, but in America, what you have is uh, oftentimes a, a curriculum mm. that allows black children to look at their own history, look at their own past. Within Britain, um, the only history when it comes to black history is about slavery, mm. right? That's the starting point, slavery. It isn't history that highlights the contribution of uh, the black people to the building of the UK or the fact that there were black rulers, black leaders, mm. prominent black scientists. That isn't, that isn't expressed within the curriculum. And so we are very, very much invisible within the, the curriculum. Because we are invisible, the curriculum is seen as normal. Mm. But it's, it's a bit like a spider's, uh, like a, uh, you know, a spider's web. It can be invisible to the eyes, but when the light shines on it, you can see that there is, there's a web that is there. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about um, systemic racism, it's so, so embedded within the system, it's so embedded within the society. I've often asked students when they're studying, how many black authors, how many black theorists do you look at mm -hmm. in your studies? If you take an area like psychology, and I've done this time and time and time again. I've asked psychology students, have you read any work written by any black psychologists, any theories that, that has been presented by black um, psychologists? The answer is no, we haven't. Mm. So that tells me the fact that when you finish your studies and then you are looking at an, a black person, you will be looking at, at that black person through Eurocentric lenses. Eurocentric uh, eyes, you'd be looking at, at that black person. You will see a black person behave in a particular way, and you would see that in a very, very derogatory way, that there must be a problem. Mm. The problem must be with that black person as opposed to the system in which they are in. Mm. Would you say that maybe that could also be a result of, you know, black people being like a minority group, and, you know, most of the population is maybe, um, is white? So would you say maybe that's just an issue because uh, we're a minority? Maybe that's why we don't have that many people represented in our educational system? It's a good question. Very, very good question. And it's interesting that you use the word minority. Mm. Where are we a minority? Globally, we are a majority. We are a global majority. Mm. Okay, we are mm. we're glo we're a global majority. There's more people uh, of color than there is white people. So we, we are globally, we are, we are a majority. Yeah. All right. Historically, it's never been the fact that uh, if, you, if, you take, if you take the UK, for example, a very, very tiny island compared to the rest of the world. And yet Britain, culture and influences touch uh, such a vast uh, number of countries around the world. Everywhere, yeah. So it's, it's not a fact of being the minority, it's about power. Mm. Who has the power and how was power used? Mm. And so when we look back historically, we see that those who have the power control the education. Because if you control the education, you determine what, what is knowledge and what, is, what isn't knowledge. You determine the hierarchy, what is at the top and what is at the bottom. And as I've said, um, we're not the minority we are constructed as being the minority because we live in the UK. But if you live in London, if you live in London, you're not a minority. Black people are not a minority really? within because of the population. Oh. We're not we're not a we're not a minority 
within London because of, because of the, the, the shift in, in London's population. Mm. You, and, and depend where you live in London. You may not, if you live somewhere like Peckham, you may not be a minority mm. there within, within that particular borough, within that, that particular area. So even in terms of we are a minority, but minorities have been very, very influential in life. You have, you, you, you have minority governments being very, very influential. So, but what happens is that the individual or the community is seen as the problem, that it must be something that we are doing, hence the reason why, why we don't succeed. Mm. It may well be that there, there's no doubt that there are issues there that we, we have to work through, but are those issues that, are, that seems to be culturally significant is that different from any other culture? Because every community, every society wants to see, wants to, wants to, to strive, want to achieve. Um, but when it comes to the black community, we are seen in a very, very derogatory way. Mm. So you mentioned um, problems. Mm -hmm. So from you working with young people, what problems do you see that um, are majorly seen in our um, ethnic group? Mm -hmm. What problems do you see that black people, people from African Caribbean society, what problems do they face? I think certainly young people within the UK, there's often a sense of loss of identity mm. and this feeling of shame to be black or to be African or to be Caribbean, seen in a, in a very, very negative way. That's, that is changing. Mm. But the problem tends to be around identity um, and to be able to embrace uh, their identity because they're often not taught about their identity, not taught about their culture, the language. There isn't an uh, emphasis on the, the language. Everybody emphasizes speaking English. Um, and so other culture, other languages that might be outside of that are seen in a very, very mm -hmm. derogatory way. But if you lose your sense of identity, that has a, a mental health impact on you, your sense of well-being and your mental health. Because who are you? Yes, who, who, who are you? Um, and, and that plays with a person's sense of well-being and the person's um, mental wellness. Mm. It's funny you mentioned um, being made you know, to speak in English. Because mm -hmm. even in Nigeria, for example, if someone is speaking in their native language, you know, they're seen as less important than if they're speaking with a British accent yes. or an American accent, yeah. you know. If you're speaking that way, you're seen as more educated. Yes. You're seen as more, maybe you have money, you're rich, yes. you know. But if you're speaking in your own language or in your own accent, you're seen as less yes. than that. Yes. So it's funny um, you mentioned that, but I wouldn't have seen that as a problem here, over here in the UK. Well, it is a problem because... because um, children are taught when in Rome do what the Romans do. Mm -hmm. So you, you, are in, in, you are here in the UK, your language, your accent becomes something that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, and so parents encourage the children to speak English. Um, from other communities, the children are encouraged to speak both English and their mother tongue. But within the black community, whether it's Caribbean or African, mm. um, the emphasis is on speaking proper English. Mm. Yeah, speaking proper English. Because your language is not seen as a language. Mm. Yeah, because there's, there's a hierarchy. English is seen at the top, and then everything else is not seen as the appropriate language. Mm. Um, I remember in the 80s where the police were being taught Patois and Creole, mm. languages of, 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 of um, the, the Caribbean, mm. um, because there was no recognition that actually when that person is talking, they're actually talking in a language, okay? There wasn't an understanding of the complexity of what black people had to go through to create their own language, especially from within the Caribbean because of the Spanish influence, the British influence, the Portuguese influence um, and the people who who were taken over their slave their mm. own languages and come from different tribes with different languages and so the the the, the awesome way in mm. which um, the slaves had to find a way of communicating um, that that isn't even 
come brought into the equation of the skills that that takes to integrate languages from different languages into a way that you can communicate. Um, but when it comes to language, we see that the emphasis is on the English over here. You go across to Europe, you see that children are able to speak English as well as their, their mother tongue, mm. and they speak it very, very fluently, both English and the mother tongue. But over here, we only taught to speak, focus on English. Children who are taught Spanish and French and other languages aren't really, really interested in it unless their community highlights and emphasizes the importance of language because language is, is linked to identity. Mm. You mentioned that um, people losing their identity, it can mm -hmm. affect you psychologically. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain that a bit further? Yeah, because, because your identity is who you are. Right, your the way that you communicate, the way you express yourself, the mm -hmm. things that you say, the words that you say, because language is about giving expression to who you are. If you are not able to give expressions to who you are in your own language, you've got to learn a different language. Mm -hmm. And that other language may not have the terms, it may not have the words, it may not have the concept to express you and what you are about. So if you take the word Ubuntu from South Africa, which is about um, I am because we are, I am because we are, that's a concept that goes to the root of African culture, that you and I, we are intricately connected. So if I hurt you, I hurt myself. You don't have that concept within, within the English language. Mm. So if I cannot communicate to you um, in my language the concepts that have guided my life, that shapes who I am, then it silences me. It silences me. And then the silence leads to the mental health. Mm. Right? Because we're born to express ourselves. We're born to express ourselves in, in, a, in a language that we are familiar with. We are learned, we're taught to express ourselves in a way that gives expression to who we are. So it's intricately linked to our identity. Mm -hmm. The moment I silence you, it means that everything that's going on inside of you, you've got to keep it in. Mm -hmm. And to keep that in, we pay a very, very high price. Mm -hmm. But um, when I look at maybe um, children from you know the black mm -hmm. and you know ethnic minority groups here mm -hmm. that were born here, raised here, mm -hmm. um, I don't see them as having the same sense of identity as people who might have grown up in Africa, grown yes. up in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they might understand the language better. They might mm -hmm. understand, you know, that their hometown better. Yes. But children born here, mm -hmm. um, does it affect their identity? Because um, they're in a different, they're in a different environment. Mm -hmm. There's a different language around them. They're in a different uh, place. Does this play any part on their identity? Yes, it does, because if you are in a place where you are, where you are accepted, mm. everything about you is accepted, your history is accepted, your culture is accepted, then there is um, uh, there's a sense of I belong. But if you are in a, an environment where who you are is not accepted, that the um, the, what is acceptable is if you speak the Queen's English, mm. right? Um, what is acceptable is history taught from a particular perspective that, that, that excludes you. Mm. So imagine you're sitting, you're sitting in a class with, with, with your peers who are from a different culture, a different community, and what you're studying reflects them. But it doesn't reflect who you are. Mm. How are you going to find out who you are? So you are in an environment where there is nothing around you that reflects who you are. It tells you that you are excluded. What you are, who you are, where, you, where you're from, your culture is not important enough, right? Mm. But something else is important. Something else's culture is, is important. So even though you are born here, even though you speak the language here, 
But it, when but then when you go for a job, you have the same qualification. When you have, when you go for a job, you have, you've got to go for three or four times as many interviews, or your mm-hmm. surname. So so we change our surname from an African surname to a, a European surname, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to become to be accepted to be accepted yeah. because when you talk to somebody on the phone or, or you send your CV to somebody, oh, it's, it's a European name. This this person must be okay. When they see you, it's a different story. So all of those things, all of those tensions are, are what young people are uh, battling with. Hence the reason why um, young people have, are creating, they're, they're now creating their own culture. Mm. Yeah, Afrobeats, right? Something that young people have created. But before then, um, things like uh, Lover's Rock, where the Caribbean community began to create their own music, uh, garage music, house music. Um, because it, it's where young people find that the mainstream do not accept them. Mm. And so what happens is that they begin to create their own environment, their own sense of belonging. Mm. Wow. Um, apart from identity, what other issues do young people, you know, growing up here face? Apart from identity, well, um, are you talking about black young people? Yes. Well, um, as, apart from identity, there is how the education system perceives them. Mm. And how's how's that? Well, not very, not 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 being bright, not being intelligent. Um, the aspirations that the young person has uh, may not necessarily be the one that mainstream see that they can achieve. You know, if a young person says, "I, I want to be an astronaut," well, who says you can be? A, who says you can be an astronaut? Mm. Um, but also as well, as, um, you know, what we have also is a high number of young people who are excluded from school, disproportionately. Mm. High numbers of black students, especially black boys who are excluded from, from school, right? So if you're excluded from school, it means then you are on a pathway that often leads uh, to prison. Yeah. Because you, you've been excluded from society, you've been isolated. What you're taught is that you don't belong, yeah. right? So if mainstream tells you that you don't belong, then why not link up with other people who are like you, who feel that they don't um, belong? So there are all of those kind of issues to do with exclusion, how education uh, sees them. And when I work with those same young people, and they are taught about their identity, who they are, their head begins to rise up because there's a sense of greatness that they can connect to and then they are inspired to achieve what their aspirations and their dreams are Mm -hmm. because they can see that they can do it. They begin to perform better at school because they understand why they're there at school as opposed to I'm going into school and I'm learning maths, English and science, et cetera, et cetera, without any significance as to how that relates to them. Like, I don't know if you um, saw the new um, Little Mermaid film. I've heard about it, yes. Yes, and so the so Ariel's now a black person, mm-hmm. no longer a white person. Yes, yes. So some people said they watched that, they felt more um, like, they felt more like people could see them. Mm-hmm. Young black girls watching that felt mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, I can be a princess mm-hmm. and all of that. But then some other people thought, why are you changing Ariel to a black person? Mm. You know, so... For me, I was thinking, oh, Ariel was originally white, so mm. why why does she have to be made black now? Mm-hmm. And from what you're saying, um, I feel more like, okay, maybe people, maybe people do feel like they're struggling with identity. Maybe people do feel like they're not seen. Mm-hmm. And so that's why things like that are being done. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for me, it's just not something I've noticed. Not something I maybe because I've not been in that situation. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the 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 the, the, the powerful thing about racism mm. is its hiddenness. Mm. It's that it's it's as you said when something isn't isn't overt, mm. it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I think I think what has actually happened is that the system has become very clever mm. in disguising itself, um, and unless you know you would accept something as normal. So Ariel being white is normal, right? Mm. That, 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 that is normal um, because that's what you've been taught. That is normal. Why should the Shiro be nothing but white? Mm. If, if you have a black Shiro, you know, 
um, you see that see that as abnormal. But who decides? Who decides whether Ariel should be black, white, Asian? Who decides that? Mm. But also, as well, in terms of, um, you know, you 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 mentioned you mentioned about the Disney film. But if you look at the Black Panther film, mm. the Black Panther film that um, grows so much, yeah, at the box office, mm. that was powerful. That was absolutely powerful because here you you, you have a, a black hero, mm. and within the film there is lots of expression about uh, black intelligence, um, black resources, mm. um, and uh, powerful black people. Mm. And what you see is a, a civilization that is advanced. Yeah, that was never taught when I was at school. Mm. That kind of concept of Africa being an advanced civilization. What was taught was Africa being backward, right? And so those seeds are already planted. And then how you see the world, so with Ariel becoming black, that's seen as abnormal mm. because we've learned to accept the default position that white is the default position. Mm. White is a measure of all things. But, you know, some other people came um, had the argument that um, Ariel originally, mm -hmm. like the story, mm -hmm. like because she wasn't originally black, she was ri originally white, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the story should stay that way. Like the same way Mulan, if we change Mulan to a white mm -hmm. character mm -hmm. or a black character, it might not fit the story. Right. So like with Black Panther, yeah, he's originally a black character. Yes. And so it's not like the story's being changed. What's your view on that? I in terms of the character being changed? Yes. Because again, we, we, we are, we, Characters have always been changed. If mm. you take Shakespeare, mm. yeah, Shakespeare, Othello, Othello, uh, Shakespeare, you know, Othello is 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 is, is where the black, mm. um, the, the the main character is a Moor, is a black man, mm. all right. But you've had white um, performers, white actors who played mm. that role, mm. all right, who've darkened their skin, but it's been mm. black white actors who play the role. All right, the Chinese community have of, of, of also complained about the portrayal of Chinese people where you've had white mm. actors um, putting on makeup to make themselves look mm. like Chinese. But the, the contradiction is this. This is the real contradiction. It's about we're told that we live in an inclusive society, an inclusive society. Mm. But what we're seeing is that only certain things are inclusive. Because when there's about to bring about a change, then we highlight the fact that, yeah, the main character was white. So why are we making that main character black? Mm. But actually, Cleopatra, yeah, what color was Cleopatra? Hollywood have always presented Cleopatra as white, yet Cle Cleopatra is, but there was no, no, there was no opera mm. when Hollywood presents this white Cleopatra. Right, it's mm. seen as normal, right? Or Charlton Heston playing Moses mm. is seen as normal. Mm. So there's the switching, there's mm. the switching that takes place. That yeah. Hollywood have always switched, mm. but when it comes to, um, to 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 the other way around, we see that mm. there's a problem. Yeah, because so many people have been complaining about the black Cle Cleopatra now on Netflix. <laughs> Why is she black? You right. Know, she's not supposed to be black. Right. Mm. And, 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 and that, that, that really highlights my point that mm. is so, so ingrained in mm. history. It's so, so embedded in the fact that Hollywood has played a very, very powerful role in shaping people's understanding mm. of history, understanding of culture. Mm. So Cleopatra um, White's Moses, white. Jesus of Nazareth, white. white. <laughs> All right. So, 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 so you, 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 you bring something that that has historical fact, and people are complaining about it. Why have a black Cleopatra? So you're saying historically, Cleopatra was black. I'm saying um, historically, Cleopatra was 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 black, mm. but um, Hollywood. Has taken the uh, 
creative license to mm. present Cleopatra as white. To make her more appealing yeah. or beautiful to people. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and in fact, you know, in terms of, um, you know, it, it, it kind of seems it's outrageous to think that a black woman would have been so powerful. Mm. Right? Um, and, and, and again, that, that attacks identity. Mm. Yeah? So we can't talk to our children about, actually, there was a, there, there was a, a black woman who was this powerful leader. Mm. And when we talk about Anthony and Cleopatra, actually, this is a black woman there that we, we are mm. talking about. The Queen of Sheba, likewise. Hollywood presents the Queen of Sheba as being white. Mm. Solomon as being white. Wow. So, so, so Hollywood, powerful institution mm. for many, 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 many years has shaped our understanding mm. of how we see reality. Wait, are you saying Solomon wasn't white? Because <laughs> all these years I thought he was white. Well, he was light-skinned. Really? What was he? What would, be the, what would make you think? So you, you're starting from the default position, right? Mm. What is your default position? Why would you think he's white? I think maybe all the images and even the children Bible growing up, you just see him as light skinned, light skinned. Yes. You see everyone as light skinned. Yes, of course, of course. Mm. So, so, so that becomes the norm, and this is what I, this is what I mean about children and identity. Mm. Everything you read, everything's presented to to you. You see everybody as light skinned, mm. and therefore. You accept that as that is the fact, mm. that Solomon must have been white, mm. all right? The Queen of Sheba must have been white. Cleopatra must have been white, mm. all right? Hannibal, who led the um, elephant across the plains in Europe, um, mm. would have been white because Hollywood has presented as white. As white. Yeah. The book's children's storybook has um, presented mm. those characters as white. And hence, I remember reading Bernard Code, who spoke about how the, how the British mm. education system makes the black child education subnormal, said, well, if you are presented in, in storybooks with all the main character, all that is good and positive is white, and all that is negative is black, black. as a child, why wouldn't you want, why would you not want mm. to be white? Mm. Um, the Bulbo doll experiment where black dolls and white dolls were given to kids and the kids were asked, which dolls would you prefer? And the kids were saying the white doll, mm. right? That just highlighted how deep mm. it actually is. But we accept it, mm. we, we, we've, we've accepted it and seen it as normal, mm. which has prevented us from seeing how embedded, how mm. institutionalized racism has actually become because we can't see it. Because it is something that's just, you know, constantly poured into your subconscious. Yes, Because yes. I do remember growing up, um, we had a driver, mm -hmm. and he said, after God is the white man. Wow. And when I heard that, I was thinking to myself, how can you say after God is the white wow. man? So you're not even close to God, you're after yeah. the white man. That's deep. Or maybe you're after the Asian man, that's you know, because you're darker. That's deep. But then I thought to myself, this is something they've grown up with. Yeah. Because even mentioning one time, I, I know once I said, oh, um, I don't think, you know, Jesus was white. Mm -hmm. And an old lady got angry at me. But mm -hmm. this is because they've grown up thinking that these people yes. are white and the white people are more important than them. Yes. Even like sometimes like growing up in Nigeria, yeah. I remember um, there was a, a Dutch family mm -hmm. and the little kids were riding their bicycle on the street. And someone told me, go back to your country. Wow. You're, in, you're, in, wow. you're in my country. <laughs> you're telling me to go back to my country. Wow. But you're in my country. Wow. So just showing you how, like, it's in everyone's mind. Everyone sees, you know, not everyone, mm -hmm. but most people, most Africans mm -hmm. see white people mm -hmm. or light-skinned people mm -hmm. or even light-skinned mm -hmm. African mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. as higher up than them. Because that's how the, syst that's, that's how the system was, was, was actually introduce mm. that 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 the 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 measure for beauty was whiteness that's mm. the measure for beauty mm. is white whiteness um but if 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 your teachers if the books if all the materials mm. present that then it's natural for a child to yeah. accept that is the norm and want to be that way but is it but isn't it interesting that a country that you are born in that you are told go back into go back to your own country 
Mm. So go back to the question that you ask. A black child born in the UK mm. who, who then is told, go back to your own country. Right? They're born here, speak the language, eat the food, but go back to your own country. <laughs> uh, a sense of where do I belong? Yeah. And that's where... Where I, is my country? Right. And that's where identity... And, 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 mm. and it, it creates something called cognitive dissonance. Mm. In other words, um, I'm here. I was born here. I'm educated here, but I don't belong. Mm. So mentally, mentally, there's a tension mm. inside. So who am I? Where am I supposed to be going? And part of my work is to be able to help young people discover who they are, discover the greatness inside of who, who they are, and to cause that integration on the inside to take place. So do you mind giving us like maybe five steps to discover who you are? Mm -hmm. Just something that any young people out there watching could, you know, make use of? Well, first of all, I, think I, I ask the question, what, 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 what do they like doing? Mm. What do they like doing? Okay, what, what might they be good at at school? And it may not be necessary anything everybody else sees, mm. but what is it that they're good at? What is it that they, they like to do? That is normally an indication of mm. their talent, their, their ability, and their skills. Mm. But also, what is their aspirations? What do they want to be when they're older? Mm. And why do they want to be that way? Thirdly, talk to other people. Talk to people who are around you. Talk to different people, talk to, to, to different elders, mm. different professionals within the community. Talk to people who are doing the things that you would like to, to do. Ask them the question, how did they get there? What were some of the problems? What, what were some of the barriers? Um, and then to do their own research, read up on it. Yeah, read the stories, read the, the autobiography of people who have done X, Y, and Z. Mm but also learn about the obstacles, the barriers that they would have to overcome. Watch films around what they are interested in. Are those five steps? Um, th you know what? Um, what I've learned in life is that it isn't the numbers of steps. It's the, 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 the there was something that Bruce Lee said, which I thought was really, really interesting. He says, he says I don't fear the person who practice a thousand moves. Hmm. I fear the, the person who practiced one move a thousand times. The one move a thousand times. So in other words, it isn't the, 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 the so many steps. It is, can I take the first step? Can I go and find out what I'm good at, right? Because once I find out what I'm good at, then it leads you to the next step hmm. in the journey. But if I've told you five things and you've, you haven't done one, then you're not going to go anywhere. So, Dr. Trevor, um, I discovered from reading up on you mm -hmm. that you got into education a bit later mm -hmm. than you were meant to. Mm -hmm. So you started chasing your passion late mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. um, so could you tell me a bit more about that? How did it make you feel, mm -hmm. you know, um, when most of your friends had graduated, had finished school, and you were getting into that later on in life? Mm -hmm. I think I just need to correct something there. I think the passion was always there mm. from a child. The passion, I was born with that passion and my grandmother nurtured that passion inside. Mm. But what happened was all the different barriers and all the, the different experiences that I had that actually pushed my education back. So what, what I experienced was that kind of breakthrough later on. And what age was that when you? Um, probably when I, um, probably probably in my early twenties when I became a Christian, mm. it just ignited a passion for learning, and um, that passion I wanted to know more. I wanted to 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 discover more about what the Bible said about God, what it says about life, what it says about people. I wanted to know more, and I just read, 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 mm. and as a result, um, I began to read other um, disciplines like philosophy, psychology, education, mm -hmm. teaching, science. I just began to, to read because it just seemed as if uh, my understanding was just open up. Wow. So there was no, as I said, no regrets because there's a saying that says, um, 
wisdom is wasted on youth, mm. right? Because when, you, when, when you're young, you don't appreciate what you, what you have. Mm. Um, and certainly going to university as a mature student, I thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly knew why I was going there and what I had and what I was able to um, contribute. Mm. So I realized that the race wasn't for, it wasn't a 100 meter race. It's a life journey. Learning mm. is a life journey. So I'm still learning. Mm. Yeah. So I have no regrets. Um, maybe other people probably have uh, arrived to wherever they arrived. But mm. I would say that I've gone past them. Mm. Because uh, because I, I've understood the true value of education, not just simply qualification, but the true value of education, mm. how you apply education, you learn into everyday life, how you make a difference to, to people in everyday life. Mm. What would you say to other people out there who might feel that um, it's too late for them to get into things they're passionate about? You know, they might think, oh, I'm 30 years old, I'm 40 years old, it's too late for me to do it. Yeah. Maybe I should just forget about it. What advice do you have for them? Well, I would say look at your life because your your past experience, your past experience, your, your lived experience is so, so important. In when, when you begin to look at your life, you see that those years weren't wasted years. Mm. They weren't, they were laying a solid foundation, a real, real solid foundation. Mm. And as you look back uh, those those years, you look back at, at what you've learned, those were years of preparation, mm. yeah, that now says, okay, now is the time where I'm, I'm more mature, a better understanding. Mm. Now is the time I can pursue my passion. And there's enough, remember what I said about talking to other people, reading books, there's enough uh, evidence there of mm. people who started later on in their life pursuing their passion. Mm. They recognize that those years, those early years growing up weren't wasted years but they were foundational years, mm. undergirding, giving them insight, giving them information, the opportunity to try things, made mistakes. Mm. Now they're able to move forward. So what if they now have responsibilities? Maybe they've got children, mm -hmm. they've got family, and they feel, oh, with all these responsibilities, I can't find the time to chase my dreams. I can't achieve my dreams anymore. It's too late. Yeah, you would never have the time. Mm. You will never have the time. You would never have the time. You have to make the time. So you got family whilst everyone is sleeping. That's the time that you 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 set that aside and you begin to work on your passion. You begin to work on your dream. But you will never, um, you, you know, we've all got 24 hours. Mm. Everyone that's ever born, they've had 24 hours. Why is it that some people even with family, even with responsibility, mm. they've been able to do it. The secret is, is that they make the time, right? We waste a lot of time, believe me. If we was to study what our activities are during the day, we would have wasted a lot of time. Um, if, if, I'm on the, if I'm on the bus or train, I read, mm. all right? I can put um, something um, on my phone and record it or listen to something in the car. Mm. I use the time. So it's, it's, not, it's not so much um, all the responsibility. It's about time. How am I going to use the most precious resource that I have, time? If you decide not to do something today, it's not going to stop the clock. Mm. Yeah, time keeps going. Times keep going, mm -hmm. right? But today, plant the seed. Today, start to do something. Mm. And then as you begin to start to do something, um, you begin to see things begin to change. Mm. Wow. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Trevor, for you know being here today. And I hope like whoever's watching this out there is inspired by this and also has a better understanding of their identity. So I just want to ask you three questions just okay. before. No, no five, no three five, random three. questions. Okay, right. <laughs> My first question is, what was the moment that changed your whole life? What was the moment that changed my life? I think the moment that changed my life was... Um, just surrendering to God, just hearing mm. this thought in my head, there's no need to die because Jesus died for you. Just that was 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 the transformational moment in my life. Wow. Yeah. My second question mm -hmm. is, what is your biggest regret? 
what's my biggest regret? I try not to live with regrets. Um, I don't live with, with regrets. And I'll tell you why I don't live. We, we have the word regrets, mm. right, in, in our language. Um, but I've learned, I've learned that everything that's happened to me, the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent, everything has shaped who I am. Um, and so I embrace, I don't have regrets. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have regrets because the moment I decide, you know what, I wish I'd done that, um, it, sh- it, it changes where I am. It changes what, what I've achieved. Mm. So whether it's the good, the bad, and the ugly, everything has worked to shape who I am. I may not understand everything, but it's shaped who I am. That's kind of like what the Bible says, where it says all things work together for your good. So whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. You know what, let me me just touch on that a bit, right? Mm. Because because when you say that to somebody who's going through a lot of pain, okay, they don't hear that. And there's a reason why they don't hear that, because I'm going through all of this. So how can this be working for my good? Mm. Okay, Um, a better way way of understanding that is that the pain and the hurt all the pain, all the hurt, God will make it redemptive, mm. right? So you tell Joseph in the pit, Joseph, this is working for your good. You won't be able to see it. In prison, you won't be able to see it. Mm. But everything that you've gone through it will be used in a redemptive way. God will use it to bring you out and into, out of where you are and into what God has mm. God will use it. It won't, won't, won't kind of, it won't be wasted, but it will be used. So it is being able to see that, yeah, it's painful going through pain, mm. but it will be redemptive. Mm. It will be redemptive. God will use it not only for your betterment and your advancement, but also to be a blessing. And to tie in with that, you've got to add the scripture, what um, Joseph said, that what was meant for evil that's that th- this is the redemptive bit mm. what was meant for evil god has used it for good mm. so the fact is that it, it's not saying that we don't experience the evil but what god says what was meant for evil i've used it for good mm. wow mm-hmm. and my last question what do you wish people out there knew more about god <laughs> that was very quick god 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 in him we live and move and have our being um, because that's essentially who who we are. Um, there is a, a verse from the Bible that says, um, he that walketh with wise men will become wise. And we know that there is wisdom in God's words. And so the more that we get to know God, the more that we understand God, it's the more that we discover who we are and the world that God has created and more that we're able to reach out and to, and to love other people. Wow. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. That was a great conversation with Dr. Trevor. He really gave us a lot of insight on understanding ourselves better as black people in the UK or black people around the world, wherever you may be. On our next episode, we have Wale. Wale is a 46-year-old unmarried deacon in a church, and he gives us a lot of insight on what it's like to be single in your late 40s. You don't want to miss it, guys. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. We really need all the support we can get. Thank you.